Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? I think today's show should be a little bit more chipper than yesterday. Uh, yesterday, it was kind of an April Fool's after the game against Brentford, and it was a, a frustrated community reaction. Don't know why my neck is red. I had a shave yesterday. Strange. Anyway, how you all doing? We're looking ahead. I wouldn't say we're looking forward, but we're looking ahead to the game against Chelsea on Thursday. Not really much, too much to talk about when it comes to that. I think the focus for today's show is going to be around Jason Wilcox, who Omar Barada, let's be honest, this is Omar Barada's choice, has chosen to be our new technical director. Lots of developments yesterday. Fabrizio Romano saying that he's resigned from Southampton and there's been an angry reaction. It's like Dan Ashworth V2. Man, it seems like people are really, really pissed off. The Man United are actually, you know, putting the finger out and trying to do things properly. We'll run through all the latest on that. And yeah, you know the drill by now. You fire in your questions, you fire in your comments, and I will try and answer as many of them as I can throughout the show as possible. We've got Mason Mount on the wall there. I thought he deserved it. Got his first goal for United. Going up against his former club. This, this I hope, is Mason Mount's week. That's why I hope so anyway. And we always know it's Kobe Mainu's season. But look, who's here from the member gang? Let's have a look. Good morning to Vicky, to T, to Alex and Carl. Mod gang, you're all here. Uh, and you're there too. Uh, we've got Jerry. Where's Tom? We. I used to love Tom and Jerry. Uh, everyone did, right? Uh, John Monkton, Hybrid Hunter, Saeed, Nino, Stu, Aiden. And we've got Bully as well. Good morning to all of you. Who's on Facebook? Let's have a look. Um, bit, 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 bit. We've got Trevor Williams, good morning to you. Alex Rice, um, Siraj, Josie Graydon, let's get one more. Charles, how are you all doing? Good morning to you all. I'm looking forward to the show. I always look forward to the show every single day. I say it. This is how I stay on top of United News. If I didn't do this show, I don't know, it would just it'd be, it'd be too much United News <laughs> to try and get your head around. Good morning to you as well, Tom, man. Gift in five memberships to kick off the show. And can I say, I just spoke to Joe before the show. Community manager, Joe. They got to you, man. One sec. Where's it gone? It works. Uh, and we're going to work on getting some new sounds and animations for the gifted memberships. Going to work on that this week. I've been saying I've, I've been meaning to do it. I just get swept up in the content so much that I end up missing some of those. Apologize about that. But they're happening. Now, there's one thing I want to kickstart this show with. That's a conversation about this man. All right. Kieran McKenna. When we had Ole Gunnar Solskjaer as manager, well, in fact, if you want to rewind, actually, Kieran McKenna was brought into Manchester United as, I believe, our under-18s coach from Spurs. Really highly rated coach from Spurs. Brought into Manchester United, I believe, when Mourinho was our manager. And if I remember correctly, Rui Farrier, who had always been Mourinho's assistant, just kind of, I don't know whether he decided to leave Manchester United or whether he decided to leave. I think he just decided to leave. McKenna was then promoted through into an assistant manager role. Mourinho was sacked. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer came in. McKenna was kept on as an assistant manager. And of course, Michael Carrick. Now, at that point in time, so many United fans just tried to dismiss McKenna and Carrick for having any sort of quality whatsoever. They're the problem. Get rid of them and all of our problems at United will be fixed. Our balls. Well, that was wrong. Kieran McKenna has been crushing it at Ipswich. Believe, well, not I believe, got them promoted from League One last season. This is their first season in the Championship, right? Their first season in the Championship. And they are currently top of the table. It's going to be a really tight push for who gets, it's ba right now, it's between Ipswich, Leeds and Leicester for who gets those two automatic promotion spots. And last night was a big, big win. Of course, Southampton only losing because Man United are approaching Jason Wilcox. I can't believe we did that. I can't believe we did that. <laughs> That's what they're acting like. Southampton are acting like, how dare you come after our technical director at this point of the season? We're trying to focus on the football because the technical director is really involved in what's happening there. Anyway. Last night, a 97th minute winner for Ipswich. And it's just, I'm really happy to see, I mean, McKenna's not just, it's not a fluke. McKenna is building on what he did last season in League One with Ipswich. Actually genuinely has a bit as an identity to his football. Clearly 
a very good manager. And people try to, I think, once upon a time, I, d- I don't, I don't want to put a time frame on it, but the the difference in quality between the Premier League and the Championship was huge. There are there is so much talent inside the Championship now. Whether it's Adam Wharton going um, to Crystal Palace from Blackburn Rovers, and there's plenty more. Um, it's a really exciting league, and I'll be interested to see whether or not Kieran McKenna can go the whole way. Remember last season? I think it was, um, was it in the playoff semi that uh, Michael Carrick and Middlesbrough lost? I think it was. Or was, it the, was it the final? I think it was the semi. Middlesbrough this season. I mean, they could sneak in. Six points off the playoffs right now. Seems unlikely. They could sneak in. But just fair play. It's just, I, I, I'm enjoying seeing McKenna doing well and I'm enjoying seeing Michael Carrick doing well at Middlesbrough. And as I said, both of these coaches were at Manchester United and so many United fans just said, oh, they've, they've got no qualities whatsoever. It's being proven incorrect. And people, oh, he's found his level. No. This is his first role as a head manager. Championship is a very, very hard league is my point here. It's what I'm trying to say. Anyway, speaking about the championship and speaking, this is it. Can I get 10 points here for the segue? I reckon it's a great segue. Ipswich, of course, beating Southampton last night 3-2 with that 97th minute winner. And as I said, it pretty much is Manchester United's fault. I can't believe that United have done this to Southampton. It's so unfair. Man United have... Now, the question I want to ask here, to be... don't know why my voice went high there. The question I want to ask here, right? The suggestions from... Everybody, really. The ta- Telegraph, the Times. I'm going to do a full story on this at lunchtime today, right? on the Jason Wilcox story and when it started, because I think the links first came in February. I'm going to explain how they developed. Now, the story that's been suggested here is that Southampton are really angry at Manchester United for the timing of their approach for Jason Wilcox, because it is a pivotal point in the season. I imagine if we... And look, remember that the links started in February... I imagine if we went after Wilcox, say, in January, then they would have just got pissed off and angry. Oh, well, we're planning our summer now. How dare... They're just going to be angry. And I think this is something that we are seeing with everything that we're doing. Funnily enough, the only club that haven't kicked up a stink, uh, uh, Man City with Barada. Had a very reasonable notice period. We went, we approached, he agreed, and he said, I I want to leave. They said, right, okay, good luck. And that's probably because City's contingency planning, because of the amount of money that they've got, because of the finance, because of the size of City, uh, they'd be able to cope better when Barada leaves. It doesn't like, it's not like taking out the main part of the cog and it's like, balls, we don't know what to do. Whereas Southampton, remember that Jason Wilcox has only been there nine months left as uh, City's academy director, joined them, and now Manchester United have come knocking. And Jason Wilcox has resigned. Set to join, this is from Fabrizio Romano yesterday. And Southampton are nay happy. Southampton are, I suppose, very much acting like Newcastle continue to act with Dan Ashworth. All right, this is what the story is. Let me run through this. So Fabrizio Romani yesterday reporting that Jason Wilcox has resigned. He's set to join as a new technical director, but Southampton w- refused to accept the fee. So Wilcox will resign, which is a big, which is a big moment, really. It's a big step. It puts the power in Manchester United's court. And the suggestions are that Manchester United offered Southampton 12 months salary, so a year's salary for Jason Wilcox as compensation for basically headhunting him. I mean, head, this exists in, in just in, in, all, in all lines of business. If you get headhunted, it's because a company spots the good work that you're doing and goes, I'd love you to work for my company. What's your contract? Right, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll give you a, 
a, a, a year's worth of his salary. Bear in mind, he's only been there nine months. Seems pretty reasonable. And it all, of course, depends on what the contract is. And we're, we're getting into contractual law. We're getting into employment law. And it's, it's a bit boring, really. There were reports yesterday, which I, th I thought was a bit weird. I don't know. Were these... Were these April Fools? You, did you see the reports yesterday that were linking Liverpool with Jason Wilcox and saying, um, yeah, talks were taking place. Liverpool wanted him as the technical director. Bear in mind, by the way, that David Ornstein's reported today that Liverpool have already got their technical director lined up. Isn't it weird how all of this is happening at the same time with both Liverpool and they've got Michael, what, they're going to have a new manager. Michael Ledwood's in as a new CEO. Can't remember the name of their new sporting director from, is it, is it Jason? No, it's not Jason. I don't know. From Bournemouth. Who cares? They got him from Bournemouth and they're going to get a new technical director here from Benfica. All at the same time as Manchester United are um, bringing in a new CEO, a new sporting director. So all these things are happening at the same time. It's mad. And you're saying, yeah, but look, it's just... If you're good at your job, right? If you are, if you are good at your job, there is a chance that you're going to get headhunted by a, by another probably bigger company. Progression. The thing I find strange here, right, is this concept. Let me go down here. This is this is the article from the Telegraph. Look, Southampton are angry over United's approach. Just read through this. Uh, United's approach for Jason Wilcox has sparked anger at Southampton, who are ready to make their director of football serve a full year's notice if the current compensation offer is not increased. I mean, you will definitely see parallels between this story and Dan Ashworth. All right. I think, South I will say this now, I think Southampton would have been angry at any point. Right. At any point. They would have, if we had approached it in November, they would have said, he's only been here a few months. How dare you? Southampton are angry. The Man United have approached their new sporting director for a role under in the Ineos system. And they would have been angry if we approached it at the end of the season because it's directly affecting the ability to complete the summer plans that they started. And they're really angry in April because, well, it's just it's a pivotal point of the season. Southampton are just angry, right? And it doesn't matter when this would have happened, they would have just been angry. So it's not really a timing thing, in my opinion. And you might say that's red-tinted specs, but Southampton have got a new sporting director, and it's the exact same thing as Dan Ashworth. It's what I mean. We're, it's not as if we're going out there like poaching, not poaching. And I suppose, this, again, again, this is probably part of it. So Omar Barada, when we got him from City, now he was the CEO of the City Football Group, which was a massive role. But it's not as if we took Ferran Soriano, who was their CEO, or their... Who is their sport? Is he, is he the sporting director at City? Oh, sod knows. But with Dan Ashworth, he basically is head honcho at Newcastle from a footballing perspective. Um, with Jason Wilcox at Southampton, you're basically looking at head honcho from a footballing perspective. And I think that's why um, Newcastle and now Southampton have acted very similar. And are really angry about it. Um, it is the latest obstacle for Jim Ratcliffe. United are also trying to bring in Dan Ashworth. We said that there. Reports on Monday that Wilcox had already tendered his resignation. Um, look at this. I, I don't know this bit right. Again, somebody in the comments. Anybody know a bit more about employment contract law? Who on earth has a 12-month notice period? Right? I rent out my old flat. It's got a two month notice period. I've never had a contract. I suppose I haven't really been, I've kind of been my own boss since I left uni. So again, someone speak to me in the comments. But a 12 month notice period, <laughs> a 12 month notice period, despite the fact that he's only worked at the club for nine months. It just seems like an excessive notice period. Like why would you ever sign a contract that's got a year notice? It's a long old time. Maybe it's because it's a sporting director role. It's quite a massive role. So the concept of him leaving, again, that's probably why Southampton are angry. Um, Ed, which you're saying you've known directors at an advertising agency that have had a 12 month notice period. Well, there you go. Um, it, it might just be that I'm not really 
privy to it. Chidi, you're saying it's it's normal for senior roles, uh, but this is probably what it is then. But Southampton are pissed. Pretty pissed. And the way that I was looking at this was, right, okay, so Dan Ashworth. Well, we can't get Dan Ashworth until, let's be honest, November. If I am if I remember correctly, Dan Ashworth had a nine-month notice period. And I think he resigned in February. So you do the maths, February to November, nine months. I believe um, that means that we don't have to pay anything to Newcastle. And we just wait until November. And then Dan Ashworth just walks in the door. And you've missed out on anything we've offered you. And well done, Newcastle. You've paid his salary the whole way through and you've missed out on probably a fair, a fair few million because of, you know, your standing... Fair play. You do you, all right? But I think the concept was that Manchester United... One second, let me get this photo up here. Whoop. Or more specifically, Omar Barada is building the team that he wants. Now, we know that Omar Barada is in before the summer, okay? I don't know the exact date, but he's in at the end of the season. So Omar Barada is going to be in. And Omar Barada does have experience in negotiating transfers. Did He's done it at uh, New, not Newcastle. He's done it at City. Now, in an ideal world, you would have Dan Ashworth in. You would have Omar Barada in. And you would have Jason Wilcox in. And if you've got two of the three, I think you can deal with it. I think that's probably what Manchester United were going towards here. The idea that we would have had Omar Barada in as our CEO and Jason Wilcox in as our technical director, that's probably going to be enough to sustain a successful or to support a successful summer. And then Dan Ashworth comes in and he's in from November and then we're, right, okay, this is when we're really kicking on. Uh, Stu, yep, Wilcox and Barada did work together before at City. Um, Wilcox was the academy director at Manchester. He was the under-18s coach, went through. Um, people are asking in the comments whether or not I'm going to do a deep dive on uh, Jason Wilcox. I don't personally think there's enough detail I can give you uh, that would warrant a deep dive in isolation on Jason Wilcox. However, I do plan on doing one once we have a little bit more clarity on the structure because something we still don't know here. Now, I would be surprised, but it's still technically possible. You remember a couple of weeks ago, covered a story that um, Man United had identified Dougie Friedman. I think it was uh, Miguel Delaney and it was Ed Ahrens, I believe, from The Guardian. I think it was. Had identified Dougie Friedman, pardon me, as the first choice for head of recruitment. Conceivably, it, it could still be the fact that we get a Omar Barada in as CEO, Dan Ashworth in as sporting director, Jason Wilcox in as technical director, and a new head of recruitment. I personally would be surprised because I think between... Wilcox, Ashworth, and Barada. I believe you'd have enough experience there, both in like identifying, in negotiating, in planning, in vision, to execute a solid summer transfer window. And I think if you bring in a head of recruitment there, I don't know whether there'd be like, you know, too many cooks spoil the broth sorts of conversations. So I think what I'm trying to say there is my deep dive video, I'm waiting for a little bit more clarity on. I've already done a couple of videos on the structure of how it's kind of shaping up and shape uh, just the way it's unfolding at Manchester United. But I want to wait for a bit more information before I do that. But fire any comments and questions about Jason Wilcox, about... So what do you think is going to happen then? Predictions in the comments, right? So as it stands, this is what is being reported. United have proposed compensation equivalent to a full year's salary, believing that to be a realistic and respectful offer and are adamant they have followed all the correct processes by making an official approach. Southampton, however, do not think that the length of Wilcox's notice period necessarily correlates to a compensation deal 
and say they will not accept the current offer. And they want to make him wait a year before he moves. So presumably if you resign, your notice period is still intact. What, what, what do you expect to happen from this point? We, I suppose we find ourselves, ladies and gents, in quite a similar situation to Dan Ashworth. Dan Ashworth is, has been placed on gardening leave. Jason Wilcox has resigned. And can I just say there, by the way, it's good to see United actually having a bit of pull. Barada. I think Barada will still be the most impressive out of all three appointments. I think to 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 take Barada away from that, I've already done my deep dive on Omar Barada, and it kind of makes sense when you understand this, what he's done throughout his entire career, when he's comfortable, and another bigger, op not, not necessarily a bit, I suppose it is a bigger opportunity. Might, I don't suppose it is a bigger opportunity. Moving from the established City Football Group to being the chief of bringing Manchester United back to the very top, yeah, that's as big an opportunity as you're ever going to get in football in the Premier League. And that's what's driven Barada to make that move across. Then Dan Ashworth. I mean, when it all comes out, I'm really interested to find out more about the relationship and the position of Ashworth in that Newcastle setup. Because I've seen plenty of reports and suggestions that Dan Ashworth doesn't actually have as much control as he wanted to. Doesn't have as much say as he wanted to. And that Eddie Howe and also, um, what's it called, PIF, are kind of, not meddling, but have far more influence there than Dan Ashworth actually being the chief in charge of the vision. I think, that, I think more information is going to come out on that. But bringing him in is quite impressive. And, and then, so we're taking a sporting director from Newcastle to be our new sporting director and a sporting director from Southampton to be our technical director. Now, I think a lot of you are going to ask, I can see it in the comments there, what is a technical director? Well, funnily enough, you I'm sure you do. Type the name in the comments. Who's our current technical director? I'm sure everybody knows. Of course you do. I'm, I'm, it's fire in the comments. It's a quiz. Everyone loves a quiz. Hmm. Jason Wilcox. Fletcher, indeed, John. It was Darren Fletcher. Thing is, I mean, what does Darren Fletcher do? Darren Fletcher, was it last season? Season before? I can't remember. He ended up being involved in like negotiations in... He was on the training ground. It was like, what does Darren Fletcher do? Now, I personally think, and I've... I've pretty much maintain this the whole way through. I think Darren Fletcher will stay at Manchester United in a reduced and clearer capacity. I think he's going to be the and he, and he, and again he kind of already, he kind of already operates in this role as the main point of contact between the first team and the academy in making sure that that gap is is bridged, if you know what I mean. Because of course Darren Fletcher he's he's walked that road. And Darren Fletcher's got his two boys in, two twin boys in Jack and Tyler, who hopefully will be walking that road as well. And he would love to, as a dad, I imagine, it'd be great if you could be there to sort of guide your kids through that. Be awesome. But technically, he's our technical director. I don't actually know what the specifics of a technical director are going to be. I don't know what his job role is going to be per se, but if, if but if... Omar Barada is the CEO. He's the man in charge of the overall vision, right, lads? This is where we want to be in a year's time, three years' time, five years' time. Who do I need to make this possible? He brings in Dan Ashworth, who's going to be the man who's in charge of making sure that the wheel turns and that everybody is in position on a day-to-day -day basis. So Omar Barada goes, how's everything looking, Dan? He goes, it's all good. So you've got the man in charge of the vision and the man in charge of making sure that everybody is doing what they should be doing, like Mr. Motivator. Probably shouldn't have said that about Dan Ashworth. Um, but <laughs> technically, the technical director directs technically. And maybe that's maybe that's what it is. Maybe um, Jason Wilcox will be like a step below um, Dan Ashworth and that everybody, not everybody per se, uh, but he'll be a point of contact for everybody, like making sure that everybody has what they need to do their jobs properly. And he reports in to Dan Ashworth, who maybe is spending a little bit more time looking at an overall recruitment strategy. 
Uh, Jason, you're saying, according to the Athletic, he helps youth players make the jump to the first team. And uh, that, well, that's technically what Darren Fletcher does right now. It's really interesting. To, uh, isn't it weird? I suppose it's not weird, given that we've never had it. But I find it odd how excited I am to have all these conversations about a right structure in place. It's not odd because we, we should have had it for so long. But Omar Barada, and make no mistake about this, right? We, I don't think we'd be having a conversation. I don't think we'd be approaching Jason Wilcox if Omar Barada wasn't our CEO. Having worked together with him at City as Academy Director, he's clearly identified him as being a perfect person to compliment and to work with Dan Ashworth. And Dan Ashworth wouldn't have been approached and wouldn't have been offered the job as Sporting Director if Omar Barada didn't give it, didn't give it the thumbs up. Didn't say, yeah, I think he can work really, really well. Now, an exciting appointment that we still have no clarity on, which will be happening, is this. Even if we get, so we've got Barada and we get Ashworth. And we get Jason Wilcox. Brilliant. We've got all three of them in. One role that we definitely know is still going to be filled in the Ineos setup is somebody who, I suppose, on a, on a mini perspective, held the role that Barada had at City. Or will hold the role that Barada had. So Barada at City was the CEO of the City Football Group, overseeing all 13 groups, all clubs under the umbrella. Ineos are going to be bringing somebody in to do that for Ineos. Now, technically, they've already got a director of sport in Jean-Claude Blanc, but they've also got a ton of sports. What they're going to be bringing in is somebody who specifically focuses on the multi-club football model. So Man United, Nice and Lausanne. And also, was it Abidjan in Ari Coast? I think it is. It's, we are going to hire somebody to oversee all four of those and make sure they're all linked and connected. So, for example, if we were to sign Aaron Anselmino on loan from Boca Juniors, I'm not signing on loan, if we were to sign him from Boca Juniors, we signed Tadebo from Nice this summer, and Anselmino goes into Bo to Nice on loan, that's probably something that that person would kind of organise. So there's more to come, and we still don't know whether there's going to be a head of recruitment too on top. Right, let me go down and read some of your questions. I think somebody sent in like a member chat. Uh, Mo, you're saying if Jim Ratcliffe invests, can't United pay for both directors? I mean, United could pay, but, and I've said this before, it really, really matters that United negotiate properly for Wilcox and Ashworth because it will, it will kind of set the tone for Ineos this summer. We don't want to get led down the garden path, however you want to phrase it. We've been rinsed for so long in transfer windows. If we just go, how much you want? 20 million, there you go, Newcastle, for Ashworth. It's the exact same as just bowing down to the price of a player. Of course, FFP is probably part of this too. It's like, why would... Dan Ashworth, for example, right? We could sign him now in April for hypothetically 10 million. Or you could get him for free in November. What are you going to do? You're probably going to say, right, well, we'll have to deal with that without it until November. Because that's, I mean, that's a lot of money to spend on five months, seven months. Reducing the United tax, exactly what needs to happen as well. Uh, there's a couple of super chats. Let me read these out. Akash is saying, Ineos are planting the seeds of a serious project and Wilcox knows it. For me, I would pay the 20 million to Ashworth and get this over with. Easier said. Well, kind of disagree with <laughs> exactly what I just said there. There's no way that United should be paying 20 million to Newcastle for Dan Ashworth. Like not, not one chance, not one iota that we should be paying 20 million to Newcastle for that. I think they're trying to suggest, I've seen multiple reports on this as well, that Newcastle actually paid somewhere more towards the three to five million pounds compensation mark to Brighton. And it was actually less than what was reported. And of course, they just they just plucked. Can anybody let me know? Is there any correlation between... So for example, this is kind of where it's different, right? 
So Man United, with our offer for Jason Wilcox, we can see down there that we have offered a year's worth of his salary. Proposed compensation equivalent to a full year of his salary. But they want more. Have Newcastle, another 20 million for Newcastle. Have they just pulled that out of nowhere? Is there any correlation between any correlation between Newcastle asking for 20 million and anything to do with his contract? I don't think there is. I really don't think there is. A couple more comments out down here from, uh, from members and stuff. Let me read these out. Leon, you're saying, I don't understand why Newcastle act like babies for Ashworth. Just get it done. They're paying somebody who doesn't want to be at the club. Again, they're try if I'm going to try and step in Newcastle's shoes here, they're trying to make a statement saying, well, you can't just let people come in and just take, take your head honchos. You have to stand your ground. And again, I understand it from that perspective. But there's always a compromise. There's always a middle ground. And as it stands, Newcastle don't understand that or they don't want to think about that. They're just saying it's our way or the highway. And the highway is Dan Ashworth just sitting there in gardening leave on full salary until November and then he comes in for free. I think Newcastle will budge at some point. And I think that's what United are, bank are banking on, really. Uh, Apno, you're saying, Sam, we should be ready to wait if it shows that United will be a tough, patient negotiator in the future and will not be bullied. Yeah, it's going to be, again, when it comes to a compromise, I agree on that, but to a certain point where it doesn't affect our ability to do what we want to do this summer. And I think if if Man United find themselves in a similar situation over Jason Wilcox as we found ourselves, as we find ourselves with Dan Ashworth, then I think that's a problem. Thing is, right? I don't know what Jason Wilcox's salary is going to be, but I doubt they've. I doubt very much they're asking for twenty million. So I think if United are going to bite the bullet on one of them, I think they'd probably bite the bullet and pay for Jason Wilcox, increase the compensation from one year salary to, I don't know, two years salary, increase it from three mil to five mil, sod knows. But it won't be a conversation around 20 million because they just get laughed off. And he's saying pay now, save, the, save five times that in the window. Well, that's ideally what you would do with um, everything in place. Let me see what you're saying in the comments. Newcastle will budge right after the summer window. I don't know. Um, Richard, it's a long-term investment of these executives. Leaves money for transfers. Saudi state are happy to leave people hanging. Um, we need to tell teams we are not the same negotiators we used to be, says Jim. And we won't get the mickey taken out of us. Well, that's, well, that's what we're trying to do. And as I said, Southampton being angry, they would have been angry had we approached him one week after he got the job at Southampton or in November, or at the end of the season, or in April, or in February, whenever it was, they're going to be angry because Manchester United have come knocking on the door and Jason Wilcox has gone and said, like, mate, good luck in what you're doing, right? Good, good luck with everything you're doing there, but you know, United have... Yeah. Man, United have come calling. Sorry. All right, here's my resignation. I love you. All right, love Southampton. Come back here on holiday at some point soon, but I'm leaving. And Southampton are understandably angry. But there'll be a middle ground. I, th I don't know. It just strikes me that it'll be easier to find a compromise and a middle ground with Southampton than it will be, uh, and Jason Wilcox, and it will be with Newcastle and Dan Ashworth. If I was to predict, I would say that I think United are going to stand firm over Dan Ashworth. I don't think he'll be in before the summer. I think we'll wait until November. Unless Newcastle really just backtrack. They're, they're, they are the two solutions here. United will not pay the 20 million. That is out. That is not going to happen. All right? So the two solutions with Dan Ashworth are Newcastle, rein it in. Which may or may not happen. Or United wait until November. And right now, I would probably say that's more likely. But with Jason Wilcox... Let's find out. Hopefully a million or two. I, th I don't even know how much a year's salary is for Jason Wilcox. But he's resigned. And that in itself is a good thing. But at least we've got Omar Barada in. Anybody actually know in the comments? Um, has there been a, a date put down for Omar Barada's start date? 
I don't know whether it's the end of the season. I don't know whether it's like 1st of July. I don't even know if anybody's actually reported. I think I think I remember seeing dates somewhere. But I can't remember where. Everybody's just working in the garden this summer. <laughs> if we can't get Ashworth by mid-May, we can wait until November. I think that's... I mean, even then, man, we think about it. Then you're only getting your sporting director in the middle of May. Are you really... Is that going to give you an ability to actually put a sustainable plan in, not sustainable, but an achievable plan in that you can execute right then and there? Because the season ends on the 19th of May and the Euro starts on the 12th of June. So because we've got an international tournament this summer, there's even more of a priority to get stuff done early. Prices are going to go up after the Euros for certain players. Um... And so, what is it? Euros ends on July the 12th, I think. And season starts on August 16th. So there'll be the month sort of madness and a month rush. But of course, pre-season. Man, the players are going to be, players are going to be screwed next season. I didn't even think about that. Damn, injury is going to be even worse. And of course, at least Man United have, have learned. It's not as if we're flying to America. Not as if we're flying to... Was it who? Where are we playing? Santa Fe, I think, in California. Then North Carolina. Sod knows. We're doing some sort of tour of America again. Cause of the mornings. The mornings. Uh, Prytosaurus Rex is saying gut feeling is Southampton's anger is for show. I get he would be key for the long term plan, but what business doesn't plan for key people leaving? It's easier for larger. I mean, who am I kidding? Like Southampton have been a Premier League club. Within the last 10 years, I actually don't know when they got relegated a few years ago. Um, they're a bigger club than like 75% of clubs in England. They should absolutely have a contingency plan in place. But it, uh, but it is easier. The, the, the bigger you get, the easier it is that you can invest into building those contingency plans. Because they do take time. They take investment. Um, but Southampton should absolutely have that in place. All in all, Southampton are being little bitches. A bit like Newcastle. There's going to be people that are angry I'm saying that. I don't care. We have been the laughing stock of football for a long time. And it's good to see United flexing. And it's good to see clubs angry and people angry with Man United again. I like that. I feed off that energy. The only people who've been angry at Man United are bloody Man United fans. I'm bored of being angry at my own club. I'd rather be angry. I'd rather enjoy other people being angry at my club. It means they're doing something right. I don't know who, I don't know whether Wilcox is going to come in now. Three weeks time, sod knows. But he's putting his resignation. See you later. He wants to join and I can't blame him because, well, of course he's going to get a massive pay rise as well. That always helps. Um, let me see what you're saying down there in the comments. All these guys coming in, I'm worried Eric Ten Hag will be isolated as a manager, says Moncton. I mean, that is not a fear I share whatsoever. In any way, shape or form. The manager won't be isolated. If anything, the manager is going to be far more supported. If anything, the manager is more isolated at Manchester United now than he ever would be in any sort of Ineos setup. And this is the thing that has been said a lot by myself and but. Oh, Eric Ten Hag's been support. Oh, yeah, he's been he's got loads of money. Blah blah blah. Acting like the only way you can support a manager is by giving him a checkbook. Like you absolutely, you do not understand management in any way, shape, or form if you think that is the case. Support for a manager is when he's got a question. Who do I turn to to try and get an answer of this? What, is that, what do you mean? There's, there's absolutely nobody here who I can turn to for a little bit of support, for a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of insight into maybe an area which I'm not quite as good at. That's what support is. And that is what Eric Ten Hag has never had at Manchester United, nor what any manager post Fergie has ever had. The support network of smart, knowledgeable football people. That's what makes a manager's job easy. Now, did you, do you see how shagged Eric Ten Hag looked after that game. 
look knackered. Um, <laughs> and it's not funny, really. But you can look at any every single like Solshire when he came back with the overlap, looked like he got the baby face back, or the colour was back in his face. Managing United is a quick way to age ten years in two years. It's happening to Eric Ten Hag. Um, did did it? But yeah, that's what I think about support networks. I pressed the wrong button there. <laughs> anyway, who wanted a little bit of the intro halfway through the show? Why not? <laughs> uh, that was quite funny. What's the next talking point here? <laughs> Sorry, everyone. <laughs> just waking you up. Just making sure you're watching the show. <laughs> hey, look. The fact that I've never done that before means that that's how good I that's how good I've been. All right. Whoops. <laughs> anyway, happy birthday to Andre and Nana. Drop a like on the video for Andre. Come on. Somebody who I have um uh, perfect example of what angers me in the United fan base. And I'll be honest as well, that bloke there. Two players who come November. I think if you had done like a um I don't know if you had done a poll of ah, oh, would you sell Mason Mount and Andre Nana now? Like so many United fans would have just booted them out of the club. Mason Mount got his first goal and I'm putting him on the wall there and I hope that we can celebrate him scoring against his former team on Thursday. And I hope he starts, by the way. And Andre Nana is somebody who let's be completely honest was absolutely atrocious in the Champions League. I mean, he was bad. Single-handedly responsible for us not going through. Well, technically, he's got two hands. Um, but largely at fault for us going through. Some really stupid individual mistakes. But also that red card, that wasn't technically Rashford's fault. I think it was an unfair red card. So there were other mitigating circumstances. But Andrea Nana. Form in the last five games, All right? Forest City, Everton, Liverpool, and Brentford. There is nobody talking about Onana because that's what happens when a goalkeeper's in form. You don't speak about them. The only time that a goalkeeper really is ever a point of conversation is if he has like an absolute worldie of a game. Like you remember De Gea against Arsenal. Remember that game... Where he made like, I think he made like, was it a Premier League record amount of saves? That's when you talk about a goalkeeper. Or you talk about a goalkeeper when they make a mistake. Because when goalkeepers make mistakes, it leads to a goal. Jason McCarthy, that's his job. Don't know what that, I don't know what that accent was. But it's just, it's, un, it's, un, it's kind of, it's really unfair, man. I feel, I feel for goalkeepers. But Andre and Nana, right? This season in the Premier League, no goalkeeper has prevented more goals than him. And there's only a go couple of goalkeepers who have faced more bloody shots than him, which of course is why, partly why, his prevented goals is higher. But Andrew Onana has just been, he's been far better than I think he's been given credit for since returning from AFCON. And he was never, ever, ever ever, ever a goalkeeper who was signed to face 20 to 30 shots a game. Like his shot stopping has actually improved across the course of the season. But shot stopping, if you're looking at the strengths of his game on paper, it's not, shot stopping is not, not number one, man. Yeah, man, that really was a bad Roy Keane impersonation. I'm normally better at an Irish accent. Never mind. I'll sack myself. <laughs> someone, sent, someone sent a super chat there. Let me not miss that. What'd you say? Did, 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 did. Uh, Anthony's saying, if you're working for MySpace and Facebook comes knocking, you're not going to turn it down. Makes you want to watch social. What's it called again? Social Network. Great film. Enjoyed that. Might watch it later. Tell you what, I've started watching Kin as well. Anybody watch Kin? Watch a few episodes. No spoiler alerts. Right? No spoilers. No spoilers. Um, but yeah, Anana is somebody. 
who deserve, he, he was thrown under the bus by so many United fans who just dismissed him and said, oh, he's got no qualities whatsoever, ignoring the fact that he was definitely in the top 10 goalkeepers in the world the season before, went the whole way through the Champions League with Inter and was a key part of their whole campaign. But all of that got ignored because he threw the ball in his net a couple of times in the Champions League. Boy, he was struggling. But as well as his um, shot stopping, right? The thing I'm enjoying watching with Onana is kind of he's just he's being more commanding, and that's that was a that was a key element for me as to why De Gea didn't suit Manchester United anymore. And a big reason why I was excited about seeing Anana coming in, and I think we're starting to see that a lot more, coming out actually claiming some crosses, claiming some corners, being a physical presence, not afraid of throwing his body in. Oh, remember the first game of the season against Wolves? That was absolutely should have been a penalty. Stephen, fuck's sake, Sam, that's, that's his number one job, shot stopping. Do you not realise how silly that sounds, mate? He isn't very good at it. Angry, angry, Steve. Angry, angry. The basic job of a goalkeeper, of course... Is shot stopping. But look at the elite clubs at the top, Stephen. And if you if you, if you don't want to see it, that's up to you, my friend. Because David Raya, Allison, Edison, yeah, they can shot stop. And of course, you have to be good at that as a goalkeeper. But that is not the strongest attribute of their game. And don't try and pretend it is. And all three of them have been the elite clubs at the top of the game in the Premier League for how many years now? I don't know. A long old time. Of course, you have to be a decent shot stopper, but it's just it's not the premise of the modern game in football. And if, and if you don't want to if you don't want to understand it, that's just completely up to you, man. But it's the truth. Yet we've not really seen that part of Andrea Nana's game quite yet. Which is very frustrating, really, because that was probably the biggest reason he was signed. Most improved player, says Onana, most improved player? I mean, I suppose across the course of the season, maybe you could say that. I don't know. Um, oh, who gifted five memberships? Yes, Shanks. Shanks and Bigfoot. Sweet like Jack the Ball. You know something that made me really upset the other day? I was listening to the radio and I heard a um I heard a drum and bass re a drum and bass song that sampled Coolio Gangster's Paradise. Now let me see what year that came out in. I'm pretty sure it was the nineties. Ninety five. Damn. And it just made me feel really old because I thought I was listening to that that drum and bass song. I thought there's gonna be loads of kids that don't know that song now, and I was like, man. It's not, it's not the best sample in the world, but it's the, it's the equivalent of in 1995, me hearing a sample from 1965 and going, what's this? And I was like, damn. Because so many songs these days, you just it's just crap samples. If you're going to use a sample, sample it properly. Anyway, that's my little moan. Felt really old when I said that. Uh, the low most consistent player, I personally, I personally think so. Don't think, surely there's nobody. That's, that's, yeah, actually, no. It's definitely not Onana is the most yeah James you're saying Coolio sampled that song yeah he probably did actually and I don't know where that came from he might have sampled it from the 60s it just kind of part it just passes on ah, the way the way the songs work um, ba -da -ba -da -ba -ba -ba. last couple of minutes of the show fire in your questions tell me that goalkeepers should just be shot stopping and nothing else in the modern game <laughs> anything else you want to talk about see look we might we might disagree alright Stephen I'm, I'm not being an arsehole, I would just massively disagree and I can I can speak to you about your comments. I can speak to you about your incorrect opinions and try and fix them for you. Um Gungshi. Anybody like my shirt? Quite like it. It's called Aztec, I think. Gungshi, you done. How you been, man? Haven't seen you in a little while. Somebody asking there about mate, California Love. Drum bass remix. That's an old school one. You know it's a really, really good one. Um one of my favourite ever Drum and bass remixes is the streets. It's too late. I love drum and bass, by the way. Liquid drum and bass. That's 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 at my core. 
I haven't been to a good rave in a long time. Maybe when the foot's healed. Damn, I miss that. Dark, dark places, loud music. Mm. A happy place. Um, no, Josh, it's not Hawaiian. In any way, shape or form, you're heathen. It's actually got two pockets. I didn't realise it's got two. What shirts have two pockets? That seems a bit pointless. You ever seen a shirt with two pockets? Don't know. And you can't stand Dean Beer. Well, it's not my fault you're, not, you're uncultured. <laughs> uh, uh, what are we saying down here in the comments now? Let's have a look. Eric Tenag in, says Dion. Our manager needs support. Hey, look, I've, I've been, um, been saying it a long time. The only person who is going to keep Eric Ten Hag's job now is Eric Ten Hag. All right? And that Brentford game was damaging. That Brentford game was just as damaging as the Fulham game at home. There are going to be some standout games where Ineos are going, I mean, we got played off the park at home against Fulham. We got demolished, let's be honest, by Brentford away from home. And even after all of that, you score a 97th minute and you still don't win the game. It's ridiculous. Um, Supreme, I've been placed on gardening leave a couple of times. Generally, it's acknowledged. You start working for your new employer straight away, but you just can't be seen to do so. <laughs> Dan Ashworth is rocking into Carrington with Misty. Just put him in like the bottom of like a laundry basket and just wheel him in. Seen that in films a couple of times. Ronnie Size. I like a bit of Ronnie Size. Um, did, 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 did. What are we saying down here? <laughs> That was a fun show. I enjoyed that. See, I told you. <sighs> Can United just turn up against Chelsea, please? For the love... God. I'm going to do my starting 11 for Chelsea. I'll do it tomorrow. For today's video, I want to do it on Jason Wilcox. I want to sort of explain the full story, right? Um, One second there. Aiden, you've said proper proper drum and bass, like Pendulum, is where it's at. Now, I love Pendulum. Hold Your Colour, one of my favourite albums. I came that as a kid. But proper drum and bass? Question mark, question mark, question mark. I put logistics above them. I put high contrast above them. There's loads of new stuff as well. Technomatic. Um, Wilkinson's banging too. I need to go to a good drum and bass rave. Pendulum's got some bangers there, but Hold Your Colour is probably my top three of all time. Logistics Machine is another one. Fun fact. Actually, no, I won't tell you that. I might save this for... A, but I have actually got a really fun fact, but I'm, I'm going to save this for the Friday show. But look, I'm going to wrap this one up for today. That was a good show. Sorry about the accidental intro. <laughs> I'll play through the show. Andy C as well. Banging. I had tickets to go and see Andy C. And that I think he did like a five-hour set at O2. Um, I can't remember why I didn't go, why I couldn't go. I think I couldn't go. Anyway, thank you all for tuning in. If you can, drop a like on the video. Uh, I'll be here tomorrow, as always. I'll be here this lunchtime with my Jason Wilcox full story video. And that's it. Thank you very much, Gungshi, to everybody else who gifted memberships for today. Legends. All of you join the Discord. Let me leave the link for the Discord here. Did it, did 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 all right. See ya.